before we start, I need you to just have a, a mental picture as to what we're talking about in terms of level and flatness, because the two basically go together in terms of interpreting the quality or otherwise and characteristics of, a, of an industrial concrete floor. So, if you look at this, this floor is level because it more or less stays on a level within a certain band. It can be classified as level, but it's not flat. Where it's marked not flat, you may, if you're fortunate enough, see some waves, okay? That's known as the short wave characteristic of a floor. This floor is flat. In other words, it's a constant slope, but it's not level because, as you can see from the, the uh, caption, it is sloping down. Now, it's an issue to see how you can control where you have level and flatness what limits you're prepared to put to it. So, prior to 1988, we had the ubiquitous straight edge. The straight edge ends up as being a specification which Brian and the Cement and Concrete Institute and the, now the, the Concrete Institute would classify as being inappropriate and unenforceable because it actually means very little bordering nothing but it was all that was around. So let's just have a quick look at it. You're doing a straight edge test. How can it be difficult? It's easy. Lay a straight edge on the floor and measure the gap underneath it. So pick one. What's that floor doing? The one's got a hump and it's on a slope. The other one's got a valley and it's on a slope. And uh, now we put it on blocks to try and make it make sense. So how do we measure what at what point? And believe it or believe it not, over the years, we've been laying floors. We have had engineers who come along, put it like that, put their foot on the left-hand side, and then measure the gap down on the right-hand side. Now, if you were using that as a method, how the hell would you measure that floor? And by the way, it's not very big. That's give or take 10,000 square meters. So figure out what the hell you would do if you were trying to do one over 50,000 square meters. So it's always doomed to failure, and these are the reasons why it fails. It fails because it's impractical. It fails because it's got no fixed application method. It has no definition, for example, of the number of tests that you would need to take in order to get any kind of evaluation. It's open to a variety of interpretations. One guy wants it done this way, another guy wants it done that way. The engineer's got his foot on the straight edge, etc., etc. And more importantly, it's hell on the back and the knees and the neck and so on and so forth. So, straight edge doesn't work. So, the question is, what does work? Now, to figure out, we set the genesis. The genesis of what is today known as TR34, which I'll give you a little bit more detail on as we go, tended to come about because around about the mid-1970s, materials handling people invented the machine, which they loosely term as a turret truck. Functionally, that turret truck has a couple of peculiarities attached to it. It operates in that sort of environment. Okay, so what do we know about that sort of environment? Let's have a look at it. There's a truck. There's a man. The top bearer bars on that setup are 13 meters above the floor level. And if you want to translate 13 meters, that's a four-story building. The gap between the rack faces, which forms the aisle, is usually of the order of 1,900 millimeters. The guide rails and or the guidance system gives you a truck clearance of about 1,500. So you've got 400 left, which if you divide by two means you've got 200 clearance either side. With your 200 clearance either side, you've got a projection of pallets, which can be anything up, anything between 100 and 150 millimeters, so you're kind of draining the space away. So now you come along with your straight edge and you figure, you know what, I think I've got something of a problem because I don't have a hell of a lot of space left over. And now you start to turn on the agony. And the agony goes something like this. We come up with an animal called a static lean table. This is simple mathematics. If the truck as you see it, that's the truck in the aisle, so you can see there's not a hell of a lot of clearance. And for obvious reasons, it gets worse the higher you go. If that truck is standing with its left wheel, three millimeters higher than its right field over a baseline of 1,500 millimeters, then at 13 meters above floor level, the cant is of the order of 35 millimeters. 
So of the 100 you had available, you've just taken 35 away. But there's a reason why they call it the static lean table, that truck standing still. When it rolls, you get a dynamic sway developing in that mass. And that can be up to three times what you've got static. So the 100 millimeters you've got has very rapidly become the fact that you're using 105 millimeters of space and you've only got 100 millimeters available to you. So what that ends up doing is it gives you the idea that maybe it's important that you really should find some way other than the straight edge of developing some way of measuring that flaw. So it took until 1988 for three parties to sit down and put their heads together. They're the logical three parties. One, BITER, British Industrial Truck Association, SEMA, Storage Equipment Manufacturers, and the Concrete Society, United Kingdom. Because it's all very well saying, I want this, but what is actually achievable? And that's why it took time to come up with answers. And answers get divided initially to three sets of criteria. What you're looking at is term property one. The truck has two front wheels. You measure a difference in elevation over a horizontal distance of 300 millimeters, and you end up with property one. That's for the left wheel and for the right wheel. But that... Most people fall into the trap of thinking, well, that's the be-all and the end-all, the specification. It isn't, because what you're really looking for is you're looking for the rate of change of that truck running down the aisle. If you remember the one photograph that said flat, and you saw undulations. If you remember what you saw underneath the straight edges, you can see those undulations translated pictorially. And while the left wheel of the truck may be going up, the right wheel of the truck may be going down. So you've got a problem in terms of the floor profile. And what you're looking at here, property two, is if you consider the left-hand point as being point one, the middle point as being two, and the right-hand point as being three, you've now got to carry on doing that at 300 millimeter intervals all the way down the aisle, left side and right side, and the measure that you're taking is the difference between one and three via two. Does that sound complicated? I hope it does, because it is. So, while you're doing all this, your left wheel is doing one thing, your right wheel is doing something totally different. So at each of the points that you've been taking that 300 millimeter reading, you need to check transverse across the aisle, across the 1500 millimeters, what the difference in elevation is. And for all of that, you've got to set up some limits. Now, the limits that were set up initially that in the initial publication, um, TR34 is a huge document. It's a design document, it's a it has a hell of a lot of information, but tucked away in there is this particular aspect. So, the original classification was in a narrow aisle, super flat, which is not an expression like we used to have a, a market, a supermarket, and a hypermarket. That's a, that's a term that was used specifically to indicate a set of values. If your Materials handling equipment lift height was over 13 meters, then property one, that was the 300 millimeter run. 95% of the readings that you take at 300 millimeter intervals must not be greater than 0.75 of one millimeter, and the remaining 5% not greater than one millimeter. Your property two, one and 1.5, and transverse, if the truck was one, up to 1.5 meters wide, you would have 95% uh, of the, the measurements that you take must be 1.5 millimeters or less, and those, the 5% that exceeds, if it exceeds, may not exceed a total of 2.5. Obviously, as, your, as the height of your racking comes down, or you, in the bracket of 8 to 13 meters, you end up with category 1. Below 8 meters, you end up with category 2. I want to tell you that in 2014, that any engineer who's involved in running a project where he doesn't make super flat, or DM1 as it is today, decides, well, it's a bloody good idea to actually drop the top bearer bar from 13.125 meters to 12.875, and that way you can drop. I'm not talking about ethics, but I am talking about reality because it actually happens. So who wants to waste his time taking elevation readings? Answer, nobody. So some clever guys invented a gadget called a profilograph. What does a profilograph do? It does all the dirty work that you don't want to do because you don't want to be taking thousands of measurements, elevation differences, more importantly, when you've taken them, you've still got to interpret them. So you've got to put them together to pick up property two. And I might tell you there's a hell of a lot of action that happens over a distance of 300 millimeters where you've taken your elevation readings. But because this takes a reading every 10 millimeters, in effect, it gives you a graphic trace that tells you precisely what the truck is going to see. 
In 2014, the latest version of TR34, the fourth edition, categorically states that over a period of time, it's not just what's happening with the front wheels of the truck that's important, it's what's happening with the body of the truck. So a profilograph today has to have certain characteristics, and those characteristics include the fact that these wheel positions in the front, as you see them, they imitate the center line of the front wheels of the unit that is running in the arm. The distance between those wheels and the rear drive wheels of that truck is represented by the length of that bar. That varies from truck to truck, therefore you can vary the lengths accordingly. And the center lines of those rear wheels represent the center lines of the drive wheels of the unit. So that nowadays when you run this thing down the aisle, you will actually get a full picture of what the truck is going to see when it's running, and it will produce a report. The unit itself, you'll see a PDA standing on top of it. Nowadays it's all, hey, real high-tech. It's all downloaded. You don't actually have to do a thing. The, characteristics, the characteristic requirements, that's a guy doing it in an under-construction situation. He's marked the center line of the aisle. It appears that he's dragging it. He isn't dragging it. In order for a profilograph to give you any kind of reading that you can put any faith into, it must be motorized in such a way that it gives you constant velocity. If you haven't got constant velocity, you've got false readings. Don't believe them at the end of the day. There's a lot of um, accelerometers and uh, old missile guidance technology that's been built into these things. And all that guy is doing, in point of fact, is he has a string which is keeping the thing running on a straight line. Bear in mind, the wheels of the truck will be about 230 millimeters, which is considerably wider than the wheels that you've got there. So the fact that the thing may be moving around is not a particularly big problem because it's still on the truck path. But what does happen is that because the floor is uneven, what does happen to the profilograph is obviously it's tending to move around if the floor is uneven because it's affecting its wheels. So all he's doing is he's guiding it. So you can do it under construction, or you can do it when the facility is already in service. And what that prof profilograph does for you is give you this kind of readout. So from this readout, you can interpret, we limited this to showing you what would happen with the right longitudinal graph, in other words, what's happening with the right-hand wheel, what's happening with the transverse graph. And the software basically gives you a visual um, impression of what the truck is actually experiencing and can also, if needs be, give you a guide as to what grinding may be necessary in order to bring that floor back into, uh, back into the required tolerances. So that was 1988. The construction industry and specifying authorities, certainly in the UK and in Europe uh, and in America, we're very keen on the fact that you no longer have the straight edge and, and guessing games and different interpretations and what have you. This is actually pretty straightforward because you've got to know what it is that you're getting. And this is going to give it to you. So they say, that's great. Well, that's great for what are termed VNA or very narrow aisle installations where the truck path and its stability is absolutely critical. What about big wide floors? So. Those are big wide floors, but if you take a good look, the gap between the racks is now extended to give or take three meters. The trucks that service a V&A have got a rotating head. They rotate through 180 degrees, so the truck itself runs straight down an aisle, always runs on exactly the same path, which makes the interpretation, according to the profilograph, absolutely critical, because it can't vary much. And its head rotates, so it'll select a left or right dumping or picking position at the end of the day. When you get around to this situation, it's totally different because the truck itself turns and selects a pallet storage position and stores or retrieves accordingly. So you cannot apply the VNA specifications to this situation. The VNA is a fixed path. Today, it's known as a DM, or Defined Movement Specification, because it's utterly defined. This, there's an infinite number of ways a truck can travel in that aisle and arrive at any one point. So the specification becomes meaningless. So if there are engineers sitting here, or the guys that put out the specification, either A, the one that says three millimeters under three meters straight edge, or the guy who tells me I need a profilograph to measure that floor, do us all a favor, read the book. 